So Matthew 25, last Sunday, we went over the timing of Jesus's return. Very important. Jesus is coming back. Did you know that? Very important. Um, we know from verse 29 of chapter 24 that his return is going to be at the end of the tribulation, the end of that seven year period. But Jesus also warned us that no one knows the day or the hour in verse 36 he says, you know, it's going to be at the end immediately after the tribulation, but no one knows the actual day and the hour of his return. And Jesus then shifts gears for the rest of us uh, of chapters 24 and 25 to exhort us about how do you now live while you're waiting for him to come back? How are you supposed to live? He has expectations of us. Did you know that? So much of Christianity is like, it's about what God can do for us. And believe me, God does everything for us. And it's awesome. But God also in this relationship says, listen, I bought you. And now I've bought you with a purpose in mind, a, a desire in mind that will be for your best and for my glory. Does that make sense? Those things are, are, are to be in harmony there. So there's an expectation that he has on us as believers, how we're to live while we're waiting, we're to live in faith. And so Jesus, for the rest of the chapter of 24 and 25, he starts to tell us about that. And Jesus starts painting pictures. He does it from biblical history. He goes out of the old Testament, the very beginning, and he goes into stories. He gives some parables and stories about that will help shape our understanding about what he desires of us. He uses uh, in verse 37 with the example of those in the day of Noah who were living in the days of Noah. They were not ready when God's judgment came and they kept living their lives as if nothing was ever going to happen. And really this typifies us apart from the grace of God in our lives. We don't, this is the way the world goes. We don't expect judgment to come. But Jesus says there was, there was an unawareness until the rains came and it was too late and they got swept away. And so Jesus says in verses uh, 39 through 41, so will be this coming of the son of man. It's going to be like that around the world. When he comes back, then two men will be in a field. One will be taken. One will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken. One will be left. And so there'll be one taken one left. The idea is one will be in judgment. One will be saved. That's the picture. And so in verse 42, he calls everybody to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake for you don't know what day the Lord is coming back. Then in verse 43, he gives another example of one who was not ready. A master of a house, a master of a house is supposed to be the one who's not only providing, but protecting, providing, but protecting. And that was the picture there. And so Jesus says in verse 44, uh, because he was asleep when the thief broke in, he says, therefore you must also be ready for the son of man is coming in an hour. You don't expect the thief came at what time he knocked on the door, said, hello, how you doing? I'm going to come and take, take your stuff. No, he did it when they were asleep, dead asleep. You know, I woke up last night at like, I don't know. It was like three or four in the morning or whatever time it was. And I was thinking this would be a perfect time for a thief because I have been out and I have no idea what's going on, you know? And so this is what Jesus says. If the master had known what time the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake. Well, you know, he's coming. So stay awake. That's the idea. And there's an idea there of being, having a spiritual readiness, an awareness of his coming. Not like those who got swept away in the days of Noah were just living their lives as if, as if he wasn't coming. No, he's coming. So wake up, live like it. But on the other hand, verse 48 and 49, the wicked servant doesn't live as if his master's returning and begins to get drunk and beat his fellow servant. What does Jesus say for that person? The person who wasn't ready. One verses 50 and 51, the master of that servant will come one day when he does not expect him at an hour when he does not know, and he will cut him into pieces and put him with the hypocrites in that place. There will be weeping and the gnashing of teeth. Jesus words, not pastor Matt. That's what he says will happen to the person who was a servant who was not ready. He'll cut him up. He'll throw him with the hypocrites where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. In other words, judgment. So he's dividing over and over people into one of two camps. You're either awake or you're not awake. You're ready or you're not, you're not ready. You're working or you're not working. Your faith is being active or it's not. 
These types of things. So the faithful, my servant is blessed and rewarded. Blessed is the servant who I'm fine doing those things. He says, but the one not cuts pieces. So there's a lot there. And Jesus is talking about the judgment of hell for those who don't. So Jesus is telling us that we are either one or the other. We're either the faithful servant, the wise servant, or we are not. And this is the whole theme of the chapter. So we say, Hey, I'm saved. Yay. Right. I love Jesus. I go to church. Wonderful. Well, Jesus goes, okay. Proof is in the pudding. (laughs) This is what I say saved is. This is what I say a believer is. This is how a believer lives and works and, and moves in my kingdom. Does that make sense? We don't like that because I just want There's always a tension in scripture. We are saved by grace through faith. Absolutely. But that is not a, an evidenceless workless faith. Does that make sense? There's fruit that comes from the, it proves out who we are. Does that make sense? We're not saved because of what we've done. We're saved because of what he's done, but that's proved out in how we live. And that's what Jesus saying. Make sense. It will, it will, as we move on. So Jesus continues on in chapters in chapter 25 with two more pictures, two more pictures. Yeah. Like Jesus, you keep saying the same things like, yeah, how many of us get it? How many of us are going to walk out of here today and still be asleep? How many of us are going to walk out of here today and not be ready? How many of us are going to walk out of here today and our lives are not going to change? I'm preaching to myself, right? He's serious and he keeps repeating it. And each time he repeats it, he gets a little different shift on it. So we kind of wake up. And so here he goes in chapter 25 and he gives two more examples for us right away. First of the 10 virgins. And secondly of the parable of the talents, 10 virgins, then the talents, Okay. These are the two parables that he is going to give us to kind of continue to paint that picture of you're either in one camp or the other. (laughs) Then the kingdom of heaven, he says in verse one will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. The kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. He says, then meaning in the future, this is what it will be like. Now we're not, we're going, what are you talking about here? We're living in 2023 in America and the United States. And what, you know, the, the word virgins is confusing because uh, there aren't any. Um, what's he talking about? What we're talking about here is a Jewish wedding. That's what's in view. Jesus is using the picture of a Jewish wedding. There were two major parts to getting married back then. And similar to what we're doing right now, you get engaged and you get married. Make sense? Betrothal was their word for it. And what's difference between their engagement and our engagement is that the the groom would go to the father of the bride and give him a dowry, would give him a down payment for the wife. And there was a reason behind that. Because first of all, can you take care of my daughter? Number one, that's important. Can you prove that you can take care of my daughter? That's really important, right? Number two, Uh, when I go ahead and and, and give you this, it's not buying property. It's not what's happening. Your, your, the father has rule and protection over his family. It is a big loss to lose a family member. Make sense. Who works so hard and provides so much within the family. Any of you have family with all everybody working together to, to make the family run. You understand this, especially in an agrarian society. And so, Hey, this will help compensate for that. Second, thirdly, there's divorce that occasionally happened and they would use that and cause the, the wife in those days would, would be, they wouldn't have an option to do anything. So the father would take that money and help provide for her should something happen. So there's a lot of reasons for the dowry, but anyways, the idea is that, and you can kind of get this from a spiritual pre- for, uh, perspective. We were bought with a price from so to speak, our father, not father in heaven, but he paid the price to redeem us from the marketplace of sin, so to speak, different picture there. But regardless, you became betrothed. Mary was betrothed to Joseph, right? Before 
they actually had the second part of getting married, which is actually the ceremony. And it means you're, you're married for all intents and purposes, except for you're not together. You're not together, but you were considered married. No, no other people, no other situations. It's kind of like our engagement. So what happened is that then there would be the actual wedding, which would happen now between the wedding and the betrothal, the, the husband would go start to build their future home. And usually they'd build it on top of their, the father's house or part of their father's house. If you go out in the middle of the East, they kind of compound uh, a lot. Even to this day, they compound, they live together. They have communal living. And so they have stories where they live together. This is probably the imagery of in my father's house are many mansions are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you. So Jesus is away preparing a place for his bride right now. And, and the imagery is not that, Oh, he's stacking. He's like, listen, there's going to be a place where he's going to come and get us as his bride and bring us to him. And we're going to have a home with him. Does that, does that make sense? And so there's a, there's a, there's a gap of time there, but in the meantime, the bride is waiting and she's anticipating the day of the marriage, right? She, the, the husband's going off and he's building the house and doing all the things. And of course they're talking and all this stuff, but they aren't living together. But there's going to be a day when that marriage, that betrothal becomes reality in actual practical living with one another. And that's the picture that Jesus is using here for us, that there is a bride and her bridesmaids, the 10 virgins. And by the way, virgins is just saying young ladies who aren't married because everybody, most everybody was a virgin in those days. Purity is a godly thing. Jesus was a virgin. And we look at that as some kind of like, it's like, no, it's the other way. God has, he knows what he's doing. So anyways, there's these 10 young virgins, just means young ladies. And they're waiting for the broom, the groom to come and grab the bride at any time. So as the day approaches, they're supposed to be ready, right? They're ready. And what would happen is the groom would come in the middle of the night or whenever, when they weren't expecting it it was an exciting thing. There would be an announcement. There would be a a shofar blow. There would be a a big horn that would sound and and the groom and his groomsmen would come and, and the, and the bride and her bridesmaids would kind of come out to meet him. And then he would grab her and bring them back to the wedding and they'd have a procession back. And if it was at night, there'd be lamps that were lit. They would light their torches and they would go back and there'd just be this beautiful picture. So if you were Jew, you would get what Jesus is saying. Now us as Americans, do we kind of understand what he's saying? So, Jesus says of these 10 virgins, the wedding party in verse two, five were of them were foolish and five of them were wise. And if you've been tracking, you know, Jesus is using them to divide people into two camps. He's making a point. Five were foolish. Five were wise. Why were five of them foolish? Well, let's check it out. Verse three, for when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took their flasks of oil with their lamps. The thing that divided the, the wise between the unwise is five were prepared for a night wedding. <laughs> five were not. They all knew about it, but five were prepared. Five were not. So the story, they all, they all knew the groom, the groom was coming any time. They're not like the first set of story where they didn't know. They all knew. But now what's happening is that only five were prepared, five were ready, five were not, right? Well, verse five tells us as the bridegroom was delayed, so there was an announcement that he was coming. There was an anticipation and they're, they're, they're almost ready. But as they were delayed, guess what happened? They all became drowsy and slept. They all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a cry. Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and ran to their mirrors and got their makeup ready. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. It's interesting here that everyone fell asleep. Now in the previous parables, if you fell asleep, that was a bad thing, right? Right. Now, why don't we drag that into this one? Some people do, but here's the thing about Jesus is he'll take a picture and he'll paint it and he'll make a point in that story. 
Then I'll take that picture and tweak it a little bit to make a different point, a different emphasis. If you go back to Matthew 13 in your notes later on, Jesus had the parable of the sower of the seed. Remember that the parable was a farmer went out cast seed on different ground and different crop, uh, different ability. Uh, the, the, the seed, the sower was the Lord. The seed was the word of God. The ground was the hearts and the different crops were that represented the different people that responded to the word. Right? Well, then he goes on straight from there to the parable of the wheat and the tares. And then a farmer came out and spread. He had a crop of wheat coming up. But what happened is now there's another farmer that comes in an enemy farmer, so to speak. And he comes and throws weeds in the middle of the field. And so the, see how he takes it and shifts it a little bit. And the point isn't receiving the word of God. The point is now something different. The point is that there, the enemy is sowing pseudo believers among believers. And if you can see, Jesus is kind of doing the same thing here. He's shifting it. And he's saying the point isn't sleep being sleep or wake. It's, are you ready? That's his point. Are you ready? Of course it means you're ready in the first one, but are you ready? That's the point. And what does ready mean? Do you have oil in your lamp? That's what he's going at. Are you a wise or an unwise servant? Because there's a difference. You can, you can know about the return of Jesus. You can have all the theology down, but if you don't have the oil, you're not ready. Make sense a little bit. So he's talking about something else. So five virgins had no oil. They were not ready. Five did. All 10 were aware, but only five were ready. What does that mean? We'll see in just a second. So at midnight, there was a cry and they go out to meet him, but five didn't have oil. It's a nighttime wedding. He came at an hour. They did not expect. They knew this day was coming, but they weren't prepared Five had no oil. Verse nine. But the wise answered saying, because they said, hey, give us your oil. Since there's not enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. Now, the point of this parable, again, is not the virtues of sharing. We look at this and go, oh, why is Jesus You're supposed to share? You know, this is basically Jesus is like, I'm not talking about sharing. That's not the point. I'm not talking about being awake or being asleep. That's not my point. My point is you read, are you ready? Make sense? So Jesus is making another spiritual point. If you notice the oil is something they need to have before the bridegroom comes, they needed the oil before he came. When he got there, it's too late. That's the point. The oil here has to be a picture of salvation and the oil has to be a picture of the Holy spirit, the evidence of our salvation the light that we have within us. I think those two, two are tied together. When a person is saved, we're born of the spirit. You're born of the spirit. God's spirit enters your heart. And Ephesians chapter one, 13 and 14 says he is the down payment. He's the proof that you're saved. The spirit is now within you. That's the proof of a believer that you now have his light in your life. You're no longer dark. You're not, you're, you're awake. You're not, you're not asleep. You're awake and aware of the things of God. You are concerned about the return of Jesus. You're concerned about his will. You're manifesting the fruit of his spirit in your life. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, self-control. And the other one, I forget that I probably need more of in my life. Right. And all those things you're in and you're empowered by the Holy spirit. So you've got the evidence of him in you by your character. That's changed. You've got the power of the Holy spirit. He's empowering you to live and to follow Christ, right? There's a difference in you. You're now convicted over sin and you're following Jesus. You're now a light to the world. You're not putting it under a, a thing. You're a light by the nature of who you are. You are sharing his light. You can't help it because you're walking and following. You have the Holy spirit within you. That's what a believer is. It's one who has the oil in the lamp. Do you have his oil in your lamp? Good question. By the way, proof verses, therefore he's the guarantee and all that stuff. Romans eight, verse nine, 
Ephesians 1, 13, 14. Romans 8, verse 9, Ephesians 1, 13, 14. There's more there. But the Spirit, how do you get the Spirit? When John was on the scene, John the Baptist, he said, man, you better be, better wise up. Because one is coming after me who is not going to baptize you with, the, with water only. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And those are two paradigms. What are you talking about? Baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire. He's taking something physical and giving us the real spiritual reality behind it. He says, either he's going to give you eternal life or eternal judgment. You will either have one or the other. He has the power to do one or the other. You better be ready. Make sense. You either have the oil, you have his life within you. You are born again. You you've believed upon Jesus or you haven't. And there's an evidence of it. So the spirit is received through faith in Jesus alone. You cannot work up the spirit. You cannot manufacture the spirit. You cannot purchase the the spirit. You receive. It is a gift of God. He is the down payment. He has not left you as orphans. When we believe in Jesus, God freely gives us his spirit. That's how you know you're his. The spirit comes in your life and you're different. I can't make you have that. I can't give you my spirit. I can point you to the one who gives you the spirit. So either you have his spirit or you don't. And the believer by faith lives a life that is in step with the spirit. Are we perfect? No, obviously he's sanctifying us. He's making us more like Jesus every day. But there's something within our hearts that perseveres. It moves. It longs for God's will in our life. We want to walk as Jesus walked Galatians 5, 16 through 25 regarding the fruit of the spirit and first John two, three through six regarding walking as Jesus walked. Either you have a spirit within you through faith in Christ or you don't. And that day will prove it either the day you die or the day that he comes back. And this seems to be a picture here of what many people may proclaim to be Christians and go to church and are religious and, and even no doctrine. You can say you're a 10 virgin, you're there, but what distinguishes a believer from a non-believer? You have his spirit within you. The indwelling of the Holy spirit within a person who's believed upon Jesus. The five foolish women did not have the oil. They were not ready for Jesus's return. And it was too late for them to be saved at that point. There is a day when the ark is shutting. There is a day when there's no turning back when he calls your ticket or when he shouts from the sky, there's a day when it's done. Amen. And they could not receive. And this is another important important point is that we, is that the, the, the virgin said, go buy something Now Jesus isn't trying to make a point, but you, uh, uh, he is making a point, but the point isn't the theology of buying or selling, but you need to know that the Holy spirit can't be purchased. It's something that's given. And I emphasize that before. Remember Simon, the sorcerer, he saw what Peter had and John had back in acts. He goes, I want that. What do I need to buy that from you? And he just said, man, you better pray and repent because you've got evil in your heart and God's going to judge you. That's the words of Peter. Basically I'm paraphrasing. So it can't be purchased. It's a gift and God desires to freely give you his spirit. Well, how does that happen? Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom. So like these five virgins here, salvation and the gift of the Holy spirit is not received is only received by grace through faith in Christ. And how they're going to buy it. The bridegroom came and those who were, this is verse 10. Those who were ready um, went in with him to the marriage feast and the door was shut. That's purposeful. That's what he's been talking about. Noah ark door shut no more. So obviously it's the day you die or when, Jesus comes back, but that what's in view here is the second coming. That's what's in view here. The believers are gathered to the Lord because they're his. They're the ones who have the spirit. 
right? They have the, the proof, the down payment of our inheritance is in them. Like a torch in the night, we're lit up for him. Amen. They're the ones who enter. But when that door shuts, no more. That's it. No more grace. Verse 31. And after the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. You're not mine. You know, Matthew 7, 21, flip back left. I know it's ancient history for us, but Matthew 7, you remember back left. I'm sure your pages are all worn out. We we're probably there forever. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. What's going on with these 10 virgins? What does Jesus say here in Matthew 7, 21 through 23? Very similar. Scary verse. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who what is born again. Is that what it says? What does it say? The one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. Well, who's the one who does the will of the father? It's the one who's born again, (laughs) right? So Jesus is just saying, it's the person who's, who's been changed by grace through faith. And then the fruit is there. Who's entering into the kingdom? Well, who's the one who does the will of the father? The one who has a spirit, the one who's been saved by grace through faith. We follow after Jesus perfectly. No, that's who it is. That's what he's saying on that day. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Then I go to church in your name that cast out demons in your name and do many works in your name. What emphasis does Jesus place on all those things? As he says, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you depart from me. You workers of lawlessness. Wow. The five unwise virgins, they knew they were probably doing all the churchy stuff, but they didn't have the Lord. That's scary, isn't it? The oil is the proof, the Holy spirit, the character, the love and the good works, the love and obedience to Jesus Christ. And Jesus knows who our is sheep are. Verse 13. Watch therefore, for you neither know the day or the hour. He says it again. Are you ready? Do you have the oil? If not, now is the time. Call out and say, Lord, I'm a mess. Your son died for me. Save me. I have no oil in my lamp. I've got nothing. And he will freely give you what he died to give you. His gracious son in a place at his side, undeserved, unmerited by faith. So verse 14, goes on to the second picture for it will be like a man going on a journey. Who has called who's who, uh, who called his servants and entrusted them to his property. And to one, he gave five talents and to another two and to another one to each according to his ability. And then he went away. Now a talent just represents a weight, a weight of what? I don't know, but obviously it represented his property. So probably money, gold, responsibility, do this and manage what I've given you. The idea is that there is a owner of a property. He is leaving. Jesus says this all the time. I'm going away, but I'm going to come back and you're going to have to give an account. This is the picture here that Jesus is painting. And I'm going to give you something from me that you need to, you're going to be accountable for. And in this case, he's just saying talent. That's the picture. It's a weight of something, a weight of gold, a measure, a property, a value. And so notice he says he gave to each one according to their ability. Thank you. Thank you. I love that. To, To one, he gave five. 
to one he gave two to one he gave one. Each one according to the ability. So the master didn't give to the guy who had the ability to manage five one. He gave him five. He didn't give to the one who only had the ability to manage one five. How many of us are looking at each other going, uh, or slacker, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, or whatever it might be. I, I have, there's people in this body that I'm just like going, gosh, I've got like a half a talent and they like, they spin like the half of my talent on their pinky toe. Like that, <laughs> you know, I'm just saying, they don't even think about like, it's like, I just am amazed at what God has given certain people ability to. And the other, and the other way, you know, the other way around, I think people might look at me and go, Oh, you're a pastor and you can talk and all this stuff. I'm like, it's each according. I'm responsible for what God's given me. You're responsible for what God has given you. Amen. He's made you someone totally different than me. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and you've got a, a talent and ability, time, talent, treasure that I do not. I mean, we all have 24 hours, but you know what I'm talking about, right? Responsibilities and all that stuff. Think about that. The Lord's entrusted to each person exactly according to their ability. He knows that I don't. Amen. The question is, what did these servants do with the talent entrusted to them? Verse 16, he received the five talents, went at once and traded with them. And he made five talents more. And so also he who had the two talents made two talents more. So the first two servants took what they had been given and they invested it and made that hundred percent profit or whatever it is. I'm not a math person. They made it back, right? They're investors. How many of you kind of understand the markets and all that stuff? And you invest and you go, awesome. How many of you go like, take your life saving and put it in the dirt in your backyard, you know, and it does nothing with it or, and then how many of you have invested in something and you lost 30%, you know I mean? So never mind. The idea is you don't want to, you know, we've got inflation going on right here. So doing nothing, like say doing nothing with your money. And this is not a thing to get you to do something with your money. I'm just saying by the nature of it sitting still, you're losing it. Make sense. By the nature of it sitting still, you've got 7% devaluing or whatever it is working against it in a year's time. So it'll take more dollars to buy stuff. A wise and faithful servant invests so that they can get back. And that's the point. These two first two guys did that. Well, what about the one? Well, the one verse 18 who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. So no investing. He went in, he went the pirate route and buried his treasure. Verse 11. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled his accounts with them. After how long? A long time. How long, O oh Lord? When are you coming back? Well, it's a long time here. Now, it's, you see, Jesus is getting out here, right? Jesus is talking about a second coming. He's talking about us having to give an account of what he's given to us, every single human being on the earth. So this isn't about... If you're ready, like in the first parable here, we just went through the 10 virgins. Not, are you ready? Are you saying it's like the point, his point is, are you working? Faith works. It evidences itself in doing something. You've got to be careful because I'm not talking about a work salvation, but it's very clear in James two, that faith without works is dead. And so God has given us time, talent, and treasure. It's his, he gave it to us and we are the stewards. What are you doing with it? Faith would say, Oh, in light of who you are and your love and your mercy and your return, teach me and show me how to invest in your kingdom in people with my time, with my talents, you've given me my treasure, my abilities, all those things. What do I do, Lord? How do I live? And they name me right alongside. We'll be going, well, this is how I want you to invest. Just as long as you're wasting your time, just as long as you are building your kingdom and not his, just as long as you're investing in this, not that. And he's so good at it because it appeals to our fallen nature. I've never been susceptible to that. So this isn't about if you're ready, this is about, have you been working? 
think that's an emphasis here. What's he entrusted you with? How are you investing it? So verse 20, and he would receive the five talents came forward as he's given an account, bringing five talents more saying, master, you delivered to me five talents here. I have made five talents more. Verse 21, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much entered into the joy of your master. How many of us have quoted well done, good and faithful servant and do not know the context of the word, the, the words that Jesus used here. Anyone just me. All right. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's pretty wild. Remember in previously he said wise and faithful servant. Who is the wise and faithful? Now he's saying good and faithful. Morally in line with God and in living out according to his will. Been faithful. See, Jesus is the master. We will give an account to you. And the question is what kind of servant will he find us to be to the, to the one, uh, sorry, the one who took what God has given him that five talents and made five more. What is good? The faith, good and faithful servant. Is that you? Or the, even the one talent, if that's you, not in this state, but did you take what God has given you invest it back? Do you look at your life as a way to bring him glory or do you look at your life as something to spend on yourself and your pleasure? It's challenging, isn't it? Because everything in this world is telling you to, this is about you. And everything God says, it's about him. And in him, you will find the best for you. Not only here, but forever. So, are you good in that his work was in keeping with the character of his master? Are you faithful in that your work is accomplished in the absence of his master? <laughs> right? Verse 21 says, you have been faithful over little. I will give you much. Guess what God's going to do with the good and faithful servant. God's going to reward you. How many think you're saved and you go sit on a cloud and play harp? Heaven's so boring. Heaven is so boring. Get to sit there and listen to sermons all day long. No. Listen. What you do in this life with Jesus Christ will affect what you are. Your capacity to do in eternity. There is the baseline of we all get in through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. But then there's the responsibility of what he's given us according to the rewards. Just like sin gets you into hell and the degree to which you sin gets you punishment. God is just. It would be unjust if Hitler got the same punishment as less. As someone who, you know, paid their taxes and just was denied God. Make sense? We're dealing with some heavy stuff here. I get it. But listen, God's given you talent. What are you doing with it? It's important because faith will invest and God will reward you. He will faithfully, he will reward you if you seek him diligently. So what we will do now determines what your future ability will be in the kingdom. Do you believe that? Or do you even know that? Do I know, you know, the Lord is faithful and to reward and to fit us for future responsibility in eternity for our faithfulness to him shown by our good works, which is him working in and through us, by the way. So ask yourselves, are you investing in what he has given you into his kingdom? Your time, your talent, and your treasure take evaluation right now. We just spent the weekend talking about preaching the gospel, sharing the gospel. Why? Kind of busy. Oh, sorry. Didn't mean to, didn't mean to get mess with your kingdom. I'm sorry about that. When it's convenient, we share the gospel. When it's convenient, we fellowship. When it's convenient, we're in the word. When it's convenient, this is what the world tells you. Your father says, I bought you. You're mine. 
and your best life. I'm annihilating that guy's stuff. Your best life is his life for you. And you will find the fullness of what God has for you in him, investing your time, talent, treasure. We need to change the way we think about our lives and our stuff. Do you think about your time as his time? Do you think about your possessions as his possession? Do you think about your talents and abilities as yours? Or are you, are you an owner or are you a steward? Pretty wild, huh? I love this. Jesus said to this guy, enter into the joy of your master. Little insight into heaven. It's going to be full of joy. Think of your happiest moment in life. Pales in comparison to all of eternity. People on this earth are longing for joy. They're longing for this. They're longing for the joy of the master. The picture here is that joy of the master has shared it with his faithful servant. Listen, God is joy. Love joy. And there is no one more joyous in all the universe. And you are going to be spending eternity with the most joyous being. He is the inventor of joy. It emanates from who he is and his joy. He shares with you in Christ. So divine joy. We're almost done. Just like Jesus. What about the guy with the talents, right? Uh, What about the guy with the two talents? Well, he says to them and he also, uh, And he also who had the two talents came forth saying, master, you delivered to me two talents here. I made two talents more. His master said to him, well, good, uh, good job. You know, good, well done. Good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little. I will set you over much enter into the joy of your master. Same response, same response. Well done. James said in James chapter two, 14 through 17, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed or lacked in daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace and be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works is dead. We have a living faith and that's what the Lord is saying. And as you, if you fast forward into the next chapter, the judgment is going to be based upon what people have done, what people have done. Well, what have they done? It's according to their faith, what they believe. That's why I asked, do you believe in rewards? Do you believe that he will reward you? Lastly, verse 24. What about the one? He also who had received one talent came forward saying, master, I know you to be a hard man reaping where you did not. sow, and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid did not have faith. He had fear. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. And here it is. You have what's yours. There's a lot there, but know this fear will cause you to do nothing. Why don't we share the gospel? Cause I'm digging a ditch, shoving my faith in a hole. Cause I'm afraid faith says, Nope. I'm going to actually trust God. It's different as believers. We trust him that he will make good on his promise to you. And that's where it comes down to. This guy was given one talent and he did nothing with it. And we're all guilty of it. So let me ask, do you think God will reward you if you seek him? Or is he just lying? Do you think he'll reward you? Do you think if you seek him, seek his will in your life, do you think he's going to ignore you? Do you think if you pray and ask that he won't teach you how to pray and ask and what to do in every daily situations? Do you think he won't lead you and guide you and show you what to do. Think he's going to abandon you. You think it's just what happens if you share his son, people ridicule you and mock you. Do you think he's going to just, Oh, just didn't try hard enough. Or is he going to teach you to fish? Oh, I jumped off the board and I belly flopped. I'm never doing that again. Oh, you're going to miss out on diving. 
You're going to miss out on fishing. I'll teach you. Come with me. The world rejected me. Enter into the fellowship of my suffering. We'll have joy together. You're not of this world. Come on. I've got you. I've got you now and I've got you then. You have no idea what I have for you. It's awesome. Prayer. We get so concerned about praying out loud. It's like, we need to not, it's like, just forget about it. You know, we're, I think we coddle to our fear so much. Now, I don't want to be superficial because I'm in front of people. I understand what it's like to be afraid. I really do. Take me out of this element, do something else. I have fear. Paul had fear. He said, pray, right? Pray that I may be bold. But nevertheless, we don't stay in our fear. We provoke one another to love and good works. We see that fear in one another. We go, no, that's fear. Let's get around this person and encourage the heck out of them until they're walking in faith. Amen. How many of you need more encouragement? Yeah. How many of you are kind of af- afraid right now that you're not the guy who's been investing stuff? Anyone? What are you going to do about it? You're going to go, I'm the person who's not investing. Help. That's what you need to do. And the church comes around and goes, well, me too. And then God goes, yeah, wait, hey, great, great, wonderful. Now I can work with you. Let's go. I'll teach you how to fish. It's going to be messy. Anyone like get on your bike the first time and do wheelies and stuff? Very few. (laughs) This guy buried his talent. Even when he knew what God demanded of him, he did not have faith, but his master answered him 26, you wicked and lazy servant, you slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what is mine own with interest. Jesus is taking a worldly example to give a spiritual analogy. He's saying, you knew that I would demand of her. You're going to give an account. It's coming. But the issue here was wickedness and slothfulness. Wickedness, slothfulness gives into fear. This guy was full of excuses. And so what does the master do with this wicked, lazy servant? Verse 28. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the 10 talents. For to everyone who has more will be given and he will have an abundance but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. In other words, the one who has will be given more. The one who lives by faith will be rewarded is what Jesus is saying. He will reward you. While the one who does not, even what they had will be lost. That's the picture. Verse 30 and cast that worthless servant into outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping of gnashing and teeth. He says it again. That's the imagery. So there's a lot there. It's no joke. What Jesus is saying. He says at the end of the chapter in 24, uh, end of chapter 24, 50, just really quick, bear with me. Okay. Just, this is important. I know we're tired and I talk too long, but I'm trying to get through the end of the next chapter, like to get out of the sermon on the Mount next week. Okay. Just, Verse 50, check it out of 24. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and the hour he does not know and will come to pieces and put him in the, with the hypocrites. And in that place, there will be gnashing of teeth. Then again, in verse 30, he just says, we just read it in 25, 30 and cast that worthless servant in doubt or darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Flip, look forward to verse 41. <laughs> And then he will say, depart me to those on those left. Depart from me. You cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Look at verse 46. And again, he says, and these will go away into eternal punishment. What do you think Jesus is pointing out? That's the camp you don't want to be in. And he describes who they are. The ones who are asleep, the ones who aren't ready, the ones who are foolish the ones who don't have the oil of the spirit, the ones who aren't proving out their faith in their life, right? But to the righteous, and this is where we want to end. 
Look at verse 46 of Matthew 24. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find doing so when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. Blessed. Oh, how happy you do not know. If hell is that bad, how awesome is heaven? Blessed. That's a packed word. <laughs> Those who are ready, look at verse 25, verse chapter 25, verse 10. Those who are ready went with him to the marriage feast and the door was shut. You're going to be with the Lord. Look at verses chapter 25, verses 21 and through 23. You will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. You're going to have joy. You're going to be with him. You'll be rewarded. Then in 25, 29, for to everyone who has more will be given. He will be given abundance, something you cannot even contain. It's compacted interest that God will pour out on you. In verse 25, 34, then the king Chapter 25, verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. He will reward those who seek him diligently. God is, and this is why I'm teaching this so long in in there. Because you've got to. Be aware of what Jesus is saying here. It is no joke. And I want you to be among the blessed. Amen. I want to be among the blessed in church. We've got to commit. And I say commit in that we have got to be serious about what the Lord says and point towards one another and say, Lord, in obedience to you and love to you, I'm going to invest in one another. And I'm going to encourage this little group of body. And we're going to go out to, to stay at status quo quo is, is not acceptable to the Lord. Amen. And we want to bring him glory. Don't you want to bring him glory? You, this is why you're alive. It's for him. This is the time you have. This is the moment. But I only have one talent. That's right. Let's rock that talent. Amen. Oh, but I'm washed. I've had sin. I've done this. Yeah. God's grace is bigger. Amen. He loves you. I love you. Let's do it. Huh? Lord God. Thank you so much for the words of your son that cut and heal Lord, by your grace and through faith in your son work within us, that good pleasure that you have for us to accomplish. And all we need to do is to look unto Jesus today and be obedient to him. And you will empower us to do it. It's your will. Thank you, Lord in your name. Amen.